Okay. Nice to you here. Back from the coffee break. I would like to start the second panel right now. Uh, this panel is on the opportunities in the metaverse. Um, I would like to introduce Laura, Laura Hirby from the VRBB. VRBB is a public funded association uh, funded in 2016 and they have around 80 partners and members uh, in the association. The goal of the VRBB is to yeah, foster and enable the XR industries here in Berlin and Brandenburg and beyond. And yes, I would like to hand over to Laura. Nice that you are here. Thank you, Jakob. I have to do this pitch so often, so it's nice that you did the VRBB pitch for me now. Um, I'm promising you it's going to be a very hot panel. <laughs> we are melting here, I think, all of us, but let's make it interactive and to keep you awake. Um, I tell you that in the end of our conversation, you will have the chance to ask some questions too. So just go ahead and think along with us uh, um, and prepare for some questions that you can ask in the end of, of the panel. So in order to save you this one page full of information about all these great people that I have here on the panel, um, I'm just going to kind of like do a very short introduction, this one sentence to a person, and then we're gonna dive into uh, kind of like conversations with each of you. And I told the panelists to ask each other some questions as well, because they're all kind of interlinked as the world is so connected these days. Um, Anna Michel from uh, Iona IE, CEO and co-founder of Iona IE, um, and one of the tech stars in 2021, sitting here <laughs> in the green jacket that I love, that gives me much energy. Frank Hahn, that's an interesting, I didn't write that, I have to say, and I'm not sure if you wrote it, what comes now, I hope you read the memo, it says, self-named metaverse architect and managing director of race space interesting. yes it, interesting yeah you can correct me afterwards i mean to have some you know provocation here uh, on, on on the stage then casting gold co-founder and author of the art tech report and the strategy consultant for the art ecosystem um, she advises art market entrepreneurs on digital transformation and business model innovations and serves as an art tech startup advisor. Yeah. And then finally, uh, brought here um, on stage by the help of Deutsche Bahn that cancelled his first train. Um, so we are really uh, yeah, lucky and happy actually to have you on stage. I was riding with him in the morning, I was like, and is the Klimaanlage, <laughs> is it working? And uh, it did, it worked, okay. So Simon Graf, XR professional, it's getting better and better. Um, consultant speaker, um, founder of For Real, and chairman of Next Reality Hamburg. And because you were the last uh, uh, kind of uh, to be mentioned, um, I start with you, Simon, Simon. Um, because we're kind of doing the same thing, so maybe you want to start first by telling what um, Next Reality Hamburg is all about. Okay, Next Reality Hamburg is an association, a non-profit association, that tries to educate people about the potentials of XR technology, so virtual, augmented, mixed reality, and even 360 movies, but well, let's keep that aside. And we host many events, we have an annual award show, a conference, and so on. So if you ever happen to be in Hamburg, give me a call and I'll see you around. I'll give you the whole tour of the XR ecosystem in Hamburg. Yeah. But you are recently also, I know, because uh, we, we do lots of collaborations, so I know that you have been recently quite a lot in Berlin as well. Why is that? Uh, because of my company, For Real is based in Berlin, because of my business partners, I still live in Hamburg and I tend to do so. But apart from that, I enjoy being in Berlin, being here with you guys, um, girls. Um, yeah, that's. Do you want to know more about I the company? I want to know more about For Real, the company, because that's kind of like a good start, I think, for our discussion, um, starting with you. So, okay, let me get back a few steps. So, I've been working with XR Technologies since 2014. And what I did the whole time was telling people, um, educating them again about how they and their brands or companies can utilize XR Technologies in a meaningful way. 
And this is what I do with Moria now too, but I'm writing the password metaverse, you know, but, uh, underlying the key technologies we're using are pretty much still the same. Um, I enjoy that thoroughly. Mm -hmm. You're kind of a sort of a metaverse consultant as well. I have this nice, you know, like action <laughs> with the with the ventilator. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like if you get bored, I just turn around and we have this. Yeah, this is kind of I I knew that we have this fan here, you know. So uh, uh, let's make a little bit. <laughs> Kind of, a, um, but the metaverse. Getting back to that, I mean, like, is, is Sven still around? He's still around. He's maybe in the metaverse, and he's not noticing that I'm talking to him. Sven, <laughs> you're not following me. No, just kidding. I just said you were probably in the metaverse. Um, uh, but I mean, like, I really uh, like the graphics you had this morning. Um, I think Simon actually, because of Deutsche Bahn, did you see the graphics? The, no. No. So you have to kind of send him the, the graphics. Um, but one of the questions I have uh, for you now, would we be sitting here talking about the metaverse if it wasn't for our friend Mark Zuckerberg? Probably not, <laughs> because um, well, this keynote was kind of a tool de force regarding all things metaverse, from trends to technologies and everything else. Um, yeah, I mean, you can easily look that up on Google search terms and so on and so on. Like, yeah, lots, that, that's lots, the graphic yeah, was about okay, the Google okay. search and how it peaked, yeah. So, um, yeah, now everyone's writing that wave, that password wave, so do I. But um, apart from that, uh, many, many companies have their own solutions. In my presentations, I always have a virtual uh, a virtuality continuum, which ranges from reality to virtuality. One will remember from 1994, which is quite old. But um, it's just to make people realize like I, I put companies on there on that spectrum, like which company has what kind of solution in the field of virtuality or extended reality. And well, pretty much all the big tech companies have their own solutions for, of course, very distinct use cases. So Meta is the loudest company right now, but they're definitely not the only one working on the or the Meta. For me, it was really interesting. You know, I started in August running the VRBB, and believe me or not, I didn't do anything with um, technology before that. I was running the Finnish Cultural Institute, but I came here for the networking part. And for me, I mean, like, it started in August, and then when the metaverse came, all of a sudden, everybody understood what I'm doing. You know, before the two months, I was trying to explain, you know, virtual reality, and then they were like, "Oh, metaverse!" And they started. That's also interesting. I think you noticed that too. But people keep on calling me. We want to build a museum in the metaverse. I think Frank, I should send them over to you. We get back to that uh, later. But one last question, uh, Simon, for you. You were prepared for it, so I give you actually. Yeah, I know, but I give you because that, that is paving the ground, and I'm, I'm happy we had all these other discussions, you know, on the metaverse. But you get your chance to have two sentences on the metaverse. Two sentences. Yes. I kind of just point with that. Yeah, with the, with the, the commas and, and everything. Like what the metaverse is. That's actually a really mean question because I'm asking that all my podcast guests as well. And um, well. Since there is no real definition of that, and I'm not quoting so crash or something like the book the term originated from, um, I'd go with my interpretation and keep it very simple. It's a persistent, spe a persistent spatial layer of the internet with lots of different platforms, applications, and solutions, and that's about it. That is kind of nicely now bridging over uh, to Anna. And um, Anna, I think, um, tell us a bit to start with um, about Yona, uh, uh, Yona Bears. I was. Universe. It's Yuna, yeah. Yuna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Yuna AI is a B2B SaaS platform for the fashion industry. Um, we are providing platform from uh, idea to production or idea to digital fashion, which comes later and just into metaverse, social media, and everything what you need. Um, or where you can need it uh, for, where it's needed for, and I have also to go back. We all also showed already 2018 our first digital fashion shows, and metaverse was not known. So, um, and I started in this time to create a research group how we can implement artificial intelligence into our design and product creation processes. And today we can do the total product creation by artificial intelligence, click on it and have uh, 3D in some seconds. So, but that was a process which already started 2018. You come from the, your background is in fashion, right? Yeah. So how did you kind of like, how did it happen that you spilled over and merged uh, with technology? 
Yeah, I was working as a fashion designer and I found it very inefficient and I could not really calculate what should I design. And then when I wanted to create digital products, I had to create pattern to sew it together. So it was like, do we not have something else to work with? Should we print paper still and how? So it doesn't, didn't make any sense to, uh, to me. And I started to learn programming and uh, created my first program or my first software was to transform sports data into uh, designs. So that was the first step. And the next step was um, creating a research group in my university with a total of seven developers to have a look how we can use neural networks to create fashion in a better and easier way and where we get digital products out of it. And so we had earlier in the panel this whole discussion about, you know, like Gucci now going over and, you know, designing some products for the metaverse. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, like, coming from your background, how do you look at that? Yeah, I mean, we work with a lot of companies and I was traveling actually in the beginning to all the companies almost in Europe, to a lot of them, with a big questionnaire and only 10% of these companies know how to create digital fashion. So this is the problem. They have now a big FOMO to, in, to enter into the metaverse, however this is uh, described. Um, and this is, um, yeah, this is the problem. And most of the metaverse actions of the company are coming from the marketing side. So I think that designers, don't, they don't know. Only a few designers. So it's kind of like, a, it's always great headlines, right? When uh, you're kind of launching something, the Adidas sneaker, uh, um, I think you, Simon, have actually some, some fashion uh, board online and a couple of, we can go back to that later. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, Kerstin, um, um, can you tell us about the latest art tech report that you were involved with and that you published? What's, what's it all about? Um, yes, the art and tech report, and that's, probably very important is an independent um, initiative. It's fully self-financed. It's founded by four art market entrepreneurs from Berlin. And we set out to examine last year. We really wanted to understand what the buying motivation and also the collecting motivations for art and NFT collecting is. And, and also to identify if there actually might be a difference between NFTs and collectibles in particular and art NFTs per se. So that's been the objective behind. And was there something that surprised you in the report that you published? I mean, like any of the findings you were like, okay, I didn't expect that, like that? Um, you mean in terms of findings or in general? Well, um, I think that that is sitting very nicely in this panel, in this panel because we could identify that very seriously in advance collectors as well as collectors to be, collectors being very fond of art and NFTs in general but haven't started yet collecting. Both of those collector groups said they are really longing for more curation and quality exhibition making when it comes to art and NFTs. And I think we all agree that this somehow contradicts the ideas of de decentralization and democratization of Web3. But there is a very strong desire, at least for art NFTs, to be treated like this, being it on a platform where you're really overwhelmed by a huge supply of NFTs, or in terms of how to use them and portray them in the metaverse, but also in the physical world, how to, how to create them and put the work into context, because that's what you do with art, right? So I think, to me personally, that was one of the biggest surprises. And, and who's one of the typical, because I think this is also interesting, we were talking with a couple of you, I had some conversations on, you know, like, will the metaverse come, and especially when it comes to the VR classes, you know, like, is that the kind of like future we're gonna move in? And, and the question of the consumer side, so to say, so um, now the question to you is like, who, who is the typical kind of buyer of NFT art? Can you? Tell that is that the person who bought art before, or is there a new group coming actually who is now entering the art market? Um, well, that, that was one of the very important questions we wanted to address, and the answer is there is no answer. It's been an anonymous survey, but we have been addressing NFT collectors, art NFT collectors, traditional art collectors, so there has been a decent mix uh, amongst them. 
And we could see from the data that we have people saying they've been active in the art NFT collecting field. I definitely intend to um, collect traditional artworks now. And the other way around, having traditional collectors saying we are really keen on entering this space and starting out because what we see really um, counts as art for ourselves. So it, but I wouldn't really say or want to think about there is the art NFT collector per se. But it's about collecting, and in this case, it's about art collecting. So I, I don't really think we should differentiate because um, it's, it, I think it's, it's getting a bigger space, and it should be inviting to to all uh, to all groups of collectors to make it more fun and bigger. That leads me over now, uh, Frank, to you. Uh, perhaps you can. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> working exactly. <laughs> Um, can tell a bit more about um, a rave space and, and because there is a link why art because you also have not only a, a club I have to say uh, the first uh, as we all know you know like these meetings uh, with with um, you know people we had during the lockdown they were online and <laughs> I met uh, Frank also online and in the middle of the day he asked me can you close your curtains we now go to the club and I was sitting there in my office and I was I like that. okay and yeah and I was way too Slow. Frank was like, where are you? And I was like trying to get, you know, behind him. And he was like, can you now speed up? And, uh, yeah. and I remember you, the first, um, uh, the first thing you've done, go to the bar and have a beer, <laughs> <laughs> like in real life. So the metaverse. <laughs> Waiting for that, yeah. Okay, I'm Frank. Um, I'm co-founder uh, and CEO of RaveSpace. Um, basically, we are a startup founded uh, January last year. And what we are doing, we uh, build uh, virtual uh, worlds um, running in the browser. This is a very important information. Um, so virtual 3D worlds running in the browser, they are multiplayer, you have voice chat, everything included. And the reason why we choose this technology is um, towards, uh, for example, uh, cloud technology. First of all, um, the running cost um, is very low because everything is rendered in the browser, in the phone, directly. Um, uh, towards cloud rendering, where you have huge cloud in the background and then everything is rendered in the cloud, it's super expensive and then the video streams got back um, and then um, you have lags and you need to uh, download something, you need to install something and our approach was um, to build something which is addressable just with a browser by address, you go to the address and you are in. And um, so that's our main tech stack. We build these virtual worlds, but of course, as we are in the metaverse and we build metaverse solutions, we combine <coughs> a lot of different technologies that are necessary. We also combine it with blockchain, but not necessarily. Um, yeah, and um, the reason why we got into that field was um, because um, my two co-founders, uh, they are uh, very sophisticated developers. They all uh, both has been on the HDD and especially uh, the younger one um, recently had his master in uh, computer science, especially with this topic, to building these um, virtual worlds in, uh, um, in WebGL, because that's the thing. We built our own engine, which is a layer on WebGL, uh, and that's um, a pretty... Uh, and how we make it like uh, um, accessible and uh, have it um, running with lots of different people at the same time and very fluent with avatars and all that kind of stuff, this is really cutting edge, and that's our asset. Um, but we started, it's funny, uh, we started with uh, the rave space. Um, it, was, it was basically um, a virtual techno club. And uh, because we all come uh, from the music background, and we thought, hey, um, that would be a good case, because it was also during pandemic. And we thought, um, first of all, um, all the artists have been in need. What can we do? They all have been with live streams. And, and uh, if you see live streams on Facebook, it was always a very passive, um, um, a passive um, experience and people um, have been watching like a minute and then they were away so the reason uh, the, the question was what can we do uh, where you can what's more immersive that's more uh, reality like what's uh, more catchy that's and also proactively that you can walk around and also have the same feeling that you um, when you're in the club and uh, basically that was the idea and um, f four months later we came up with the race space club which was the MVP and um, it was literally a great success. We have been from like f over 50 parties with big acts from mobile to uh, Thomas Schumacher, like it was every uh, weekend. And um, also, and this is important because sometimes um, people say, ah, when the metaverse um, um, will come, it's, it's already there. And the experience I've made in that club, I mean, you mentioned it, it was crazy. I remember the first night um, was five hours in a row and I thought, oh my God, five hours in front of the laptop. But the time was flying and the reason for what that was because um, it, I was 
almost immediately tricked and into that world. I, I, I walk to people, uh, start a conversation, they are from everywhere from the world, you could um, dance, you could uh, watch the DJ, and it was a really amazing experience. And that uh, gave us um, also the idea, um, um, yeah, not, Basically, the, the it, it was the entrance because it was yeah. somebody, uh, you know, about the question of how you can make actually money, you know, like was there an entrance fee? Yeah, it was with the entrance fee um, in the beginning, and um, and um, definitely um, still uh, the club is still up and running today. It's it's free of charge at the moment because everything. Um, if you if you buy drinks, you need to pay them, but uh, there's um, no entrance fee and everything, uh, which um, um, and the income will be donated to Ukraine. Um, and also, and the reason why I think still this project is scalable, um, but um, as uh, so many new um, projects uh, came up, um, we also developed ourselves in a different um, direction. And this because you're also making the link to the art world. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Because you yeah, also yeah, let me let me explain this, please. Um, um, because we have, we have been, um, as we have the club, um, we, and also we are in art, and we thought, hey, it would be cool to have a gallery. Um, so we just um, added to the club um, outside the yard, uh, you go to the stairs, and then there is a gallery, and then NFT has been shown. And then people came to us and said, hey, this is super dope, um, can we, can we um, uh, display our NFTs and uh, at the same time um, throw a party? And that was also another uh, great thing to build communities and stuff like that. And then, um, like almost directly after the launch of Race Space, um, we built um, the virtual museum for Wolfgang Beltraki. I don't know if you know him. He's one of the greatest art forger. And um, they had uh, they had the <laughs> they then dropped the NFT collection, and we built the virtual museum. And um, the way we did, I guess, and also the quality that was really making waves, and um, we had got super feedback from. Um, uh, Forbes magazine and blah 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 and then this was um, yeah then we now do really really great projects for a lot of great brands and um, and also one last word to the Music Central because uh, uh, to catch up the link um, and as we have seen that the Music Central uh, that um, the Beltraki um, experience was so powerful especially to experience art we thought hey we can do that also um, for our own and what we built we built our own project, it's called the Musée Decentral. Musée Decentral. Uh, and um, the great thing about this museum, the idea we have had is, uh, was um, we want to connect the traditional art world with um, the um, crypto and uh, digital artwork, uh, art world, and, but also um, we needed to uh, generate some turnover to make our company um, uh, have the power to do that because we are self-financed. So what we've done, just this, uh, um, we built a huge museum in the metaverse. I'd say it's the largest museum in the metaverse and um, it's up and running. You can um, enter it right now if you want with uh, mobile and everything. You needn't have to, but um, check it out later. And um, the cool thing about this one is we, we have 222 frames in the museum and the frames themselves are an NFT. So you just get a frame as an NFT and then you can exhibit your NFT collection uh, inside the frame. And this was the, 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 the crypto part, uh, the, the NFT art. And, but, and then we thought, okay, but we build, build two um, uh, additional rooms um, and these rooms are created by us or by the community and in this community there's um, um, space for every kind of art, it needn't have to be NFT and um, the idea was to also get a lot of people from the traditional space to get them together in one experience and to meld that and, um, and uh, to meet in this um, kind of virtual world. And as this multiplayer, people can uh, watch together, experience art, talk to each other and this kind of stuff. Cool. There was a question, I think. Did you have one? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, two questions. So, when you talked about contextualization of art NFTs, and that, uh, that is one of the biggest challenges if, with the NFT arts, like, okay, you buy one, but what do you do with it? And so, some people try to bring it out, some people in virtual museums, and some people something else. So, what were your findings about, like, how to provide some utilization like, for the art NFTs? I think everybody understood the question. Yeah? Okay, Kasper. Um, well, thank you for the question because that was one of the second, uh, the other major questions we actually tried to address and the data shows that, um, well, the majority of all art entities right now are sitting in the wallet, that's for sure. 
but we have seen a great tendency amongst collectors to look for options and solutions how to display and share the work virtually, like as in NFT exhibitions, um, using virtual museums, and uh, somehow trying to display and um, work with the art in the metaverse. But then equally, we have seen a very strong demand uh, amongst collectors to say, how can we get the art NFTs out of the wallet into the physical world? So there have been a lot of questions around how to share, how to live with art NFTs in, in a physical context, which is quite contradiction to its native context. And again, I don't think there is, I mean, if you have a solution, everyone is looking for hardware so, so far, and the only advice we can give is it's in, infinite objects, which is the best frame right now. But I think the lack of hardware to display art NFTs in your life and to start living with art in the case that we're used to live with traditional art um, is still to be explored. And we had also people saying that they started to print out the NFTs to frame them in a way they're used to, which I don't think artists want to hear. But I think Especially if it's a video. Uh, uh, yeah, well, then we have uh, multiple skills. But um, I think there's a vacuum to, to find ways how to live with it. And I've seen a new museum, and I, I understand the, the play on the frames, but me personally, I'm, I'm challenging the question if it has to be a frame when it comes to art NFTs or NFT art in general. And um, I was listening to one major collector the other day and she said, I'm not interested in frames for my home. I'm actually looking for some older technology to be incorporated in my, my home. So why does it have to be frames um, just because um, it, it is art? So maybe the use case for the metaverse might not be only to put it in a museum, but to find different ways how to add something in addition to the way you've been used to display art in real life. Um, just a yeah, I can answer that, but also I would like to add something there. A are short also, answer. Just also, so there are time also for many, many um, physical spaces now developing, showing digital art. And um, especially also if you want to see uh, guys that do that very well, um, here in Berlin, there is a Go NFT. Um, it's at Neuendorfer um, mm -hmm. Platz. Yeah. Uh, these guys, they um, made a really, really smooth transition um, between physical art and um, digital art. Um, it's great. It's um, it's mostly about street art, but it's it's really dope. Um, you can you have you have screens, but also there are some of the art with which you can see in mixed reality. So there are many many use cases, um, and it's not about just have one um, um, picture in your um, wallet. You definitely have to check it out. Go NFT at Neuendorfplatz. This is a good example which um, will um, answer your question. That leads me maybe to a question, casting to you. I mean, like, I'm not sure if this was part of the, the study, but when we think about, you know, like, uh, basically uh, the, the future of, let's say, you know, like, what kind of, like, artworks will be um, part of our cultural history, and um, there has been the discussion of that, you know, like, some collectors now have so much money, so they kind of define what art will be there in 100, 200 years from our period right now. Um, but my question to you is like, um, what about museums? Do they already buy NFT artworks? Do they understand how to deal with them, how to present them? Do they have a budget for that? Is this, you, you know, I mean like this, are they there yet, basically my question. I'm afraid I understand your question. And um, I think, well, they do start buying NFTs, but I think it's more of a formal because they, they feel like they need to. I don't really think the institutions are understanding what they are doing. And when you are positioned as a museum for contemporary art, I don't think there's any way against or around um, art NFTs because they're always going to be part of what's happening right now and will somehow become part of the art history canon. Um, if they do know what to do with them, I don't think so, because again, I don't think it's just about displaying. I, I really think you need to challenge the technology, and this also refers to the way how uh, NFT art will be shown in, in a physical context. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you were at the uh, Art Basel, and I know that you were in Paris uh, last week, I think it was, or already, yeah, exactly. And um, I did some research because LinkedIn is so transparent, you find all kind of information. So I hope you posted it right on your own page, what I'm saying right now. You were uh, for the Viva technology, and if I got it right, you were chosen among the 30 most promising female led startups, right? That's, right. Yeah, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
you know, like as I said before, I worked uh, for the Finnish Institute and coming from a small country, you used to look outside of the national box and then you're here in Germany, you're sometimes surprised how, you know, like it's very German-centered kind of like that we think when we have discourse, that's my, my kind of uh, feeling. So when you were in Paris and, and when we talk, I think about, right, XR, uh, it's really like what Paris, Canada are doing uh, also on the national side is kind of like where we would like to be one day. So wh what, what's the reaction there? What's the reaction there when you're pitching your product in, in Paris on the fair? I mean, it's a tech fair, so <laughs> it was quite good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all about, it's like kind of a web summit, but more focused on uh, technology. So we had also investors lounge and everything like that. and. Of course, all uh, startups who, which pitch, they were working in technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, it's really good that we have these challenges for female founders, because only, you know, maybe startup money to our home, the female founder situation is. So it's good that we show that in a tech fair, in a tech exhibition, exhibition, that we are female founders doing technology. Yeah, I think that I, I saw this kind of uh, information that is it startup percentage-wise, women are like somewhere around 10% in Germany or something like that? Even less, I think. Yeah. What's your vision for you f uh, for the future of um, Yona AI and, and thinking about the possibilities that come maybe with the metaverse? What, what's your, where you see yourself in five or ten years? Yeah, I think in the fashion industry we live a revolution. Finally, we are changing from physical product to a digital product, which we should have done already 10 years ago. But this industry is so traditional that, that, I mean, they couldn't understand it, they even don't understand what is happening now. So my vision for this industry is, and for Yuna, that we get the whole back end of this industry changed to a digital uh, usage of uh, di different technologies, that we maybe, of course, in every company they have 10%, 20% or the luxury industry, you have 50% creativity that should always be there, but all the other uh, carryovers we should do digitally, not only for using technology, not only for creating digital products, also for our future of our planet, because it's more sustainable. Um, I'd like to add something. Uh, I just recently uh, read a report in the US, they uh, offered 100 kids um, that they have the opportunity to have a digital sneaker for $100 or um, a physical one. I think it was a report, but I, I can't remember. But um, uh, there was over 80% that decided for the digital one. Isn't, isn't that crazy? No, so I, that, I, you yeah. see where it goes. Yeah, I tell you, my son would choose a digital one. And Probably you as a mother has your part on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, no, but I mean, like, even, you know, like, I, I, I'm always telling this story, uh, we had it about the music, you know, and about the generations to come. My daughter is 10 years old and she's playing uh, Roblox and uh, for, for uh, Christmas she wanted to have everything that was digital. And it was really this kind of discussion that we had and, you know, she's building the roller coaster stairs, she's earning money, she's also doing art, but obviously, yeah, I mean, like, Simon, you are one, um, uh, as I kind of like hinted already, that um, you are actually one uh, who is um, not a kid buying art, <laughs> buying fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah the definition question. Yeah, but when did you buy, do you remember, when did you buy your first kind of like a, yeah, fashion, uh, online fashion? Um, it depends on how you want to define it. If we go back in time, 2004 or something, skins for video games, probably, because none of that is actually really new. Like, I don't know, expressing your individuality via virtual items. And it's really hype now, and I'm always laughing a bit when the marketer approaches me, like, well, this is a new hot shit. Um, Fortnite has been generating a revenue of over 1 billion via skins even before the pandemic. Um, people are really excited about that. And I was working on a project like going into that virtual fashion direction now, um, posting stuff on Instagram. It was research in 2020 when I first bought stuff from Fabricant, one of the most yeah, renowned virtual fashion labels. And then I bought one thing and another and another. You can all see that on my Instagram page. It's funky, uh, to say the least. And yeah, uh, it's really interesting to see what kind of reaction this um, creates and how people resonate with it. Especially the younger people, they really celebrate that kind of stuff. And all the people are like, why are you fucking crazy? You paid 150 euro for a digital coach. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. 
for research purposes, that's at least. <laughs> and you know, I have something to add. Um, I don't get why this industry is not taking over fa faster, because they have to create only one item, and the margin is so high, and they, they can sell it a thousand times. So, why do they keep going only physical products they, with, with a low margin? I think this is a lot about um, the, the strategy or product, like uh, it's all about scalability or um, artificial, and that's at least in the digital space, and we see that in the two space as well, artificial scarcity. It doesn't, I mean, you know, it's a philosophical question, does it actually make sense to limit I mean, the, the, the inherent nature of digital goods and media is their productivity, but how much sense, you know, that's, uh, as I said, it's philosophical. Does it make sense to limit digital assets at all? Because you could easily scale them everywhere. But then, on the other hand, people, it's all about prestige, buying stuff, it's limited. It's an interesting question that we probably can't answer right now. Today. Yeah, they're fighting for this one microphone. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think, yeah, that's good. I think it should also stay like it is. But we have also in our industry luxury and fast fashion industry. So it should stay like that but also it should give the possibility, like in the real world, to buy digital fashion for normal people. So. Are there any questions from the audience that you have uh, linked to? Back there is a question, I um, try to be loud. So, I mean, everyone is talking about that so we are probably experiencing the biggest uh, crash after the dot-com bubble. So, uh, what do you think, like, how would that impact, uh, especially, like, transfer to the Anybody who wants to take this question? We are all fucked. No, in, in general, <laughs> um, in general, this is of course something that's happening um, in the market and it will happen and it will have implications on, of course, the digital space as well. But overall, the digital world, it, it, I mean, it's a lot about the perspective you have. Do you see the digital space as a holistic, as, as a holistic thing? Like, um, is Zoom in the same space as Meta is? somehow -ish, but also Meta invests into future technologies. Um, well, their, their stock has been going down quite frequently, like quite a lot frequently. Um, but still, they are investing. Um, the overall digital bubble isn't doing too shitty right now because, well, as the pandemic has shown us, there's a user need, and it's all about users and relevance. Users create relevance. Um, I don't think, of course, it will be impacted, but um, it will not stop the type of, let's say, digital evolution or revolution we are right now experiencing. Um, how long the uptake of the metaverse or the metaverse and their relevance will take. Even Zuckerberg, let's cut him some slack here, says it's all about five to ten years minimum. So we are at a very, very early stage in the early days. And also considering that um, the metaverse, at least at the moment, is um, um, a, a collective of several microverses, and I think that's also will be the future. That's um, it's a it's a transformation from from the, the 2D into 3D, and I assume and that's what happened recently. There will be standards, and everyone. Uh, will be developing on those standards and then um, the, the metaverse will build as a whole and um, for example a good example is it, it looks like um, Ready Player Me is um, now the standard for avatars and um, the cool thing about this one you, you just create your avatar and you can use it in our experiences and in almost uh, all experiences and I think that's going to be the future and this is independently on the so the transformation from the 2D and the, the internet will stay so it's, it's just a, um, a further development of this. Probably not for crypto. There's some other questions, maybe I take that question? Yeah, thanks for everyone on the panel. I really enjoyed the diversity of the panel and also the panel before so this is actually really new because I'm from the finance industry and traditionally the panel looks different there. Um, <laughs> You mean like blue shirts? Uh, yeah. I see my LinkedIn stream is full of blue shirts and white sneakers. So uh, what, I want to, what I want to ask is actually about the metaverse. 
I think it's a super interesting topic for all of us and I see you guys have skin in the game and work actually on projects, so this I really like really. We also looked at projects and we started to support the art space also, so for example tonight we also host an NFT and, and art uh, talk on, on Kudam. But actually for me it would be interesting, what is your opinion when really more corporates will adopt um, on, their, on their own projects, they have innovation labs, they have their own maybe uh, um, knowledge uh, knowledge bearing people working there being also fascinated about it. But when do you expect that really more attention shifts to the metaverse on a more broad level, except of Adidas and maybe some other really big brands um, that are worldwide doing some showcases to maybe use the hype of the technology and everything built, uh, built up there. So for me, the question would be, when do you see this adoption going on? Um, and yeah, what is your perspective on how corporates can bridge towards the new web, as you just uh, described it. Really good question. Anybody of you wants to take that? Anna? Um, yeah, I just read, I don't know, is it right? 2027, the market of metaverse like 430 billion euros. So that seems that 227, we are already far, far as a, or more like now. And I think the corporates need time. I really work with them. I mean, they're working manually still. And even if Adidas, <laughs> even if Adidas and Nike saying they have a metaverse uh, manager in the back. <laughs> oh yeah. Metaverse manager, my new title. <laughs> yeah, no, in, the, in the back end, they work still. I love this uh, announcement or advertising. They're saying you can you can print uh, paper still and print your stuff, but you can also come with a horse in the morning to your work. I think they need time, and uh, and that what I hope and my vision is that we come to this point that everybody that is democratized and that we everybody can use metaverse also for the corporates. It's a normal thing that it will come. Like our kids will be twenty and thirty, and they will buy immersive. They will be in the metaverse. I want to. You have the final words basically because I think you're all so hot as we are. So keep Did yourself short and make a final round of statements because it's a great question to end because it looks into the future. Yes, and I think um, a big um, impact and catalyzing uh, will be when the the uh, when the hardware um, will get, um, to touch the market like better glasses, better performance. Um, if they come like fancy gadgets, uh, remember the time when the first iPhone, now it was, nobody was um, used to this kind of usage and this will be uh, when the new glasses will come out, uh, come out in the future, um, then the technology will be consumed on a broader level and then um, also the experience will be used more on a broader level. So, um, and this will happen, it's already um, happening and it, it's, it will be going uh, very, very fast. And it can, I don't know where you are from, I can encourage everybody um, who's at the moment in the space and thinks about going in there, um, the brave will now be the ones that have an advantage um, for their business and also for their own fun, so to say. In that context, it's interesting to think that Meta now opened their first physical stores so that people actually can try on the classes. Kerstin, anything you want to say on the future of when the metaverse will happen, be part of every corporate strategy? Well, I do agree with you, um, because I think it would take some time, um, most probably because corporates can't really mirror in the metaverse what they've been doing for ages in the, in the physical world, and maybe just, um, find some applications to, to add, I think that requires time, and also I think with the metaverse it is introducing some kind of consumer-oriented economy, and I really think many corporates require a kind of mind shift before actually entering the space. Simon? Simon, Simon, <laughs> we into this. Uh, and and if, if there were any questions from there and I didn't see them, then you have to just do the follow up networking and talking. But as the final, last famous words. I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, like. Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, the beer that is on me, the next beer. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, and yeah, also, also connecting to that corporation question, it's uh, we're in a kind of Hannah Ant problem we, uh, situation right now. Many companies have a kind of FOMO, they drop shit and transform stuff and bring it into metaverse platforms. But in the end, I think what happened, and this is like a question I ask my clients and customers as well, is um, what kind of benefit do you offer? Why should people care? That was one of the last lines I got from your presentation. The sandbox, the center, that whatever's being built there is fucking boring. 
sorry. Um, the user numbers speak for themselves. Those platforms are basically a wasteland and it's only interesting for investors, not for content strategies and users. So in the end, the meta grows without people doesn't matter at all. Um, I think... Uh, that was a nice slogan. Yes, that was a nice wordplay. You did it. Exactly. So, so let's, let's end it here. And let's, <laughs> let's end it here. <laughs> it's all about, in the end, meta yeah. The reality is intertwined, virtuality and reality, and without people doesn't make sense. And if we don't offer any benefits, whether it be communication or products and so on, and to listen to what people actually want, all of this will be for nothing. Oh, well, that's a quite. Um, that quite was perfect. That was perfect. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. But thanks for being such a great panel. I was a little bit stressed out with all the heat. Thanks for being such a patient and uh, audience. And yeah, we continue from here. Thank you.